and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akri. Energy ministers from European countries meet today, seek deal on emergency gas use cuts. Guatemalan President Alejandro Gemati visits Kiev, expresses solidarity with Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky. And Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan urges all sides in the Ukraine Green Deal to act responsibly. Again, this morning from news that the energy ministers from the European Union countries are set to approve a weakened emergency proposal to curb their gas demands, with opt-outs allowing them to follow different national paths to prepare for Russian supply cuts. The European Commission last week had proposed emergency rules requiring each country to cut its gas use by 15% from August to March. The target would be voluntary, but the Commission could make it binding in a supply emergency. However, the plan has faced resistance from various governments and countries have redrafted it to include exemptions from numerous countries and industries. Coming, uh, and we don't know how cold it will be, but what we know for sure that Putin will continue to play his uh, dirty games uh, in misusing and blackmailing uh, by uh, gas supplies and uh, this is something we have to prepare our households and economies for and we have to protect them. The recent Odessa attack has shown that Russia is not and never will be a trustworthy uh, partner and just yesterday uh, Gazprom announced uh, uh, additional uh, cut on the gas supplies which immediately caused a price increase. And this is just an additional evidence or proof that uh, we have to take the game uh, in our hands and we have to reduce the dependencies on Russian supplies as soon as possible. If we will manage this, uh, all Europe uh, uh, will profit. Announcements by Gazprom underline once again that uh, we have to be ready for the possible supply cuts from Russia at any moment. And to be ready for that, we have to well act right now. So I do expect that today we will have some interesting political discussions because member states do have different circumstances, different um, starting positions, but I do expect that in the end of the day, we do have a political agreement. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Moscow of using restrictions in gas supply to inflict terror on Europe and urged the European Union to agree a tougher sanctions package against Russia. He said this in his nightly video address where he insisted that, quote, all this is done by Russia on purpose to make it as difficult as possible for Europeans to prepare for winter. We saw new gas threats to Europe. Despite the Nord Stream turbine concession, Russia is not planning to resume gas supply to European countries, as it is obliged to do under a contract. All this is done by Russia on purpose to make it as difficult as possible for Europeans to prepare for winter. And this is an open gas war that Russia is waging against a united Europe. This is precisely how it should be perceived. And they do not care what will happen to the people, how they will suffer from hunger due to the blocking of ports, or from winter cold and poverty, or from occupation. These are just different forms of terror. And that's why it is necessary to hit back. One does not need to think about how to return a turbine, but how to strengthen sanctions. One needs to do everything to limit Russian revenues, not only from gas and oil, but also from any export, which still remains, and to sever trade ties with Russia as much as possible, because every such tie is a potential means of putting pressure by Russia. 
The gas blackmail of Europe, which only gets worse every month, is needed by a terrorist state to make the life of every European worse. And this can actually be seen as an incentive for the EU's eighth sanctions package to be significantly stronger than the recently approved seventh. And uh, Guatemalan President Alejandro Guillemate has met with Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky in Kiev, becoming the first Latin American president to make the trip to the war torn country. Mr. Guillemate said at a joint news conference, we stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people who have resisted with courage. As long as human lives are lost, we cannot silence our voices. Many Latin American leaders have avoided taking a stance on Russia's invasion. That reflects, in some cases, a decades-old tie to Russia, and in others, awareness of United States foreign policy goals. President Zelensky responded by saying Ukraine's relations with Guatemala are a bridge to the entire Latin American region. Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmytro Kuleva, said the two countries signed a free visa agreement and a memorandum on cooperation uh, between diplomatic academies. And in the fight in itself, at least 10 rockets were fired by Russian troops at the town of Chuhev, 40 kilometers southeast of Kharkiv. Local police said S-300 anti-aircraft missiles hit a local school. Several private yards destroyed heating networks in one of the neighborhoods and completely destroyed the arts and leisure center. At the time of the attack, seven volunteers were in the building. Since July, they had been cooking for the needy in the charity kitchen in a cafe in the House of Culture's basement. Three people got out on their own. Cafe volunteer Mansour Pekimov was pulled out unharmed by rescuers four hours after the strike. And Ukraine is preparing to start grain exports via its Black Sea ports this week under the grain deal signed last week in Turkey. Speaking at a media briefing, Infrastructure Minister Alexander Kubrakov said the shipment from the Black Sea ports are due to start by the end of this current week. The internal technical documents of the coordination center will be developed in Istanbul within the next two days, and it is expected that they will be uh, working by tomorrow. Mr. Kubrakov said the reopening of the Black Sea ports are expected to generate extraneous income of one billion U.S. dollars for Ukraine, which will export three million tons of agricultural products per month. Ukrainian Deputy Infrastructure Minister Yuri Vaskov, who also participated in the briefing, said the first grain deliveries will be made from the port of Chonomosk. Within two weeks, Ukraine also plans to start exporting grain through the ports of Odessa, Pivedny, and Vask. The supplies of Ukrainian grain to the global market have been affected in recent months due to the blockade of the Ukrainian seaports uh, by the Russian military. And a UN spokesman has also confirmed that the first ships to export Ukraine grain uh, from the country's Black Sea ports may move within a few days. Uh, the spokesman for Han Hack said uh, a joint coordination center will liaise with the shipping industry and will publish detailed procedures for ships uh, in the near future. You will have seen a statement we issued over the weekend in which the Secretary General unequivocally condemned reported strikes in the Ukrainian port of Odessa. He stressed that on Friday, all parties made clear commitments on the global stage to ensure the safe movement of Ukrainian grain and related products to global markets. The Secretary General noted that these products are desperately needed to address the global food crisis and ease the suffering of millions of people in need around the globe. Full implementation by the Russian Federation, Ukraine, and Turkey is imperative, he said. On the Black Sea Initiative, we can tell you that since the signing of the agreement, the parties to the initiative and the UN have been in frequent contact, including yesterday. All parties have reconfirmed their commitment to the initiative. The government of Turkey has generously provided a physical space for the joint coordination center where operations are being established now. By tomorrow, all parties and the UN will have a presence in the joint coordination center in Istanbul. We expect that the first ships may move within a few days. The joint coordination center will be liaising with the shipping industry and publishing detailed procedures for ships in the very near future. Under this agreement, under this um, initiative, uh, all parties uh, do things that are helpful for what the goal of the initiative is, which is, in other words, to enable the safe transportation by merchant ships of commercial foodstuffs and fertilizers. Those, uh, those um, 
ships are traveling to three different U Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea, one of which is Odessa, uh, the other two being Chernomorsk and Yushni. And we want to make sure that all conditions are right for, for the safe travel of ships. Anything that's not commensurate with that is, of course, not helpful for the success Was of the initiative. Was this attack commensurate? Well, I think you will have seen from the statement that we made, which condemned this attack, that, that we believe that it was not it was not a helpful thing. And we want all sides, as the Secretary General made clear on Saturday, to fully implement what they have agreed to. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, in the meantime, has said that Turkey expects Kiev and Moscow to keep to their responsibilities on the deal they signed regarding the export of Ukrainian grains. Speaking in an interview with Straight Broadcaster, uh, Mr. Erdogan said, we expect them to own up to the deals they signed and to act according to the responsibilities they undertook, and that the operational aspect of the mechanism would be coordinated from a center in Istanbul where representatives are from all parties. Let's talk now to Olegzi Isjak, head of department at the National Institute for Strategic Studies. He joins us virtually from uh, Nipro uh, in the Ukraine. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Let's start with uh, what we've been reporting uh, this morning, the Russian grain, uh, the Ukraine grain deal, uh, which all parties are expected to uh, undertake their responsibilities. Uh, but last weekend, a shadow was cast over that deal when uh, there was the missile attack uh, on Odessa, which the journalist in the last clip there was asking uh, the UN spokesperson about and the impact it would have uh, on the deal. But it does appear as if the deal is going ahead. Everybody expects it to go ahead. Do you? Yes, I also expect uh, this deal until, for now it will be go ahead. And uh, Ukrainian officials, our officials uh, proclaimed that uh, Ukraine will do everything for this deal to continue. But what Russia wants to do, Russia wants to, uh, to achieve some additional conditions for this uh, deal. And this condition is clearly unacceptable for Ukraine. Russia wants to control Ukrainian ports and Russia wants to stop Ukrainian advancing of Ukrainian forces on the south of the country uh, where positions of uh, Russia are weak on the battlefield. So I, I believe it was a clear sign on behalf, a clear signal on behalf of Russia to negotiate some additional, additional conditions to control Ukrainian ports. But uh, it seems for now Ukraine is able to follow to this agreement and to continue to, to, to create conditions uh, for, for export of grain. You are talking to us this morning uh, from Nepro, uh, which has been, uh, it, it's, it's almost like it's in the center, if you like, of various uh, pushes uh, by the Ukrainians, uh, by, uh, by the Russians, uh, in the case of the Ukrainians to defend, in the case of the Russians uh, to take uh, uh, that place. How, uh, it, it appears that the area is strategic. What has been your experience uh, being in that area at this time? Uh, so, sorry, the sound is not very good. Uh, as I understand your question, it's about situation on the south of Ukraine, close to ports. Yes. Or no. My, my question is that you're reaching us from you are reaching us from Dipno. Dipno is uh, an area uh, where which is in the center of a lot of oh, attempts okay. by Ukraine to defend itself and Russians to attack. What has been your experience? Experience from my city. You yes. mean my city, Dnipro? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, the Dnipro is uh, is um, uh, to say really shalom for several fronts. And our experience is that we withstand this aggression in uh, 2014 when there was a uh, first wave, and now we have uh, experience in. Uh, on, on the level of local communities and the local power to organize echelon defense uh, from Russian invasion. And uh, to, be, to be sure for me and for everyone, then Russian 
are not able to invade uh, Dnipro city because this region is uh, is highly defended uh, due to a lot of efforts from local authorities and uh, and efforts from the state. Uh, so so the only the main thing for my city is the problem of constant uh, permanent ELS. When we when we speak now, I also may have a alert and they have to go to some shelter in fact it's not so 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 severe problem because uh, because uh, striking by missile is not uh, very big but you will never know uh, who would be a target of these strikes the strikes are every day and uh, the situation is uh, throughout of ukraine but uh, these strikes I believe, only make us, Ukrainians, more uh, persistent and more confident in our, in our victory, because the only way to stop it is to win. So so situation in Dnipro is uh, stable, and uh, I, I believe uh, Dnipro may uh, provide logistics for Ukrainian advance on front line, so the situation is like this. It's pretty secure, but not so secure. I, 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 one shudders to think when you say that it is quite possible that even as we speak now, you could, uh, you could hear the, the emergency uh, warning that would mean you need to go uh, into a shelter uh, and that would end this interview. Uh, but one hopes that that will not happen, not just because of the interview, but uh, for your own safety. But I must then ask you, about how life is within that city. Do you do you have uh, uh, access to water, to medicines, to food? Uh, is public transportation running uh, and so on? What is it like day to day there? Well, it's it's like like um, like um, uh, peacetime, except this uh, ELS, uh, except the curfew time, if I pronounce it rightly, uh, time when you have not go to street in, in, in the night. Curfew time, yes, uh, something like this. Yes, it's uh, curfew. And, uh, Cafe, cafe time. Yes, cafe time, e alerts, but uh, in general it's the same. We have uh, electricity, we have uh, water, we have uh, community transport. Um, and uh, when you, for example, if I go by my car to, to some distant areas, to, um, uh, to my friends in close city, I have to pass several uh, block, uh, block posts, uh, several passes uh, on the road where I have to show document. So there is a security, but not so severe security which changes the everyday life. Everyday life, it's almost the same uh, as it was before the war, except we have no students from Nigeria, we have no students from India, uh, and there were a lot of them in my city. Uh, so the situation is changed. No foreigners here, but uh, life is uh, pretty secure because Ukraine can and local communities can resist this Russian aggression. I, I uh, Just before I let you go, and I'm happy you made mention of the fact that uh, you had a lot of Nigerians, you had a lot of foreign students uh, in your, in your uh, institute and indeed in other schools. Uh, uh, all over Ukraine, but they had to leave uh, when this invasion began uh, towards the end of February. Uh, have there been arrangements made for them, possibly online, for them to continue their education? And then there was this issue about them getting transcripts uh, if they needed to move to another university. What can you tell us about that? Has that now been resolved or smoothened over? Regrettably, I don't know the exact situation with education. A general, a general approach is that uh, almost all education in Ukraine uh, should be online for 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 what time. But now we have um, a summer a summer break in education, so maybe some procedures uh, would be changed. But. Uh, um, I don't know whether it will be possible for foreign students to continue education in Ukraine without visiting Ukrainian uh, centers. I believe this problem will be solved by September, well, the next semester, next uh, year 
in education uh, will start. I hope uh, the problems will be uh, will be solved in 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 coming months. But I I'm not sure that uh, the problems are solved now because we have a lot of displaced person, including our own students and our own pupils, uh, millions of them, hundreds of thousands of them, and so this pro process is not organized, I believe, for now, but uh, I mean for foreign students, but uh, I believe in coming months the problems will be solved and people would get their certificates and continue education. Indeed, uh, so many people will be saying amen to that and hope that actually even by that September, the war itself would be over, some kind of peace deal would have been reached. We hope for it, uh, but I fear it will be a change on the front line, but maybe final final peace will be later. Indeed. Not Indeed. in this September. Things, yes, these things take time to unwind. Thank you very much, uh, Oleksiy Ejak, Head of Department, National Institute for Strategic Studies in Dnipro, Ukraine. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Ukraine is seeking to introduce heavy penalties for receiving a Russian citizenship. That's in a moment. Please join us again. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. We're staying with the Ukrainian Green Deal, where Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says there are no barriers to the export of grain from Ukrainian ports after Ukraine and Russia signed a deal to unblock grain shipments on the Black Sea in Turkey last week. He was speaking at a news conference where he said there was nothing in the grain agreement signed by Russia to prevent it from continuing to attack military infrastructure in Ukraine. Speaking about the episode which you mentioned that happened in Odessa, there's nothing in the commitments that Russia signed up to in Istanbul on July 22nd that would prohibit U.S. from continuing our special military operation, destroying military infrastructure and other military targets. As far as the targets hit by high-position strikes are concerned, they are located in a separate part of Odessa port in the so-called military part of Odessa. These targets were a Ukrainian Navy combat cutter and an ammunition depot to which anti-ship harpoon missiles were recently delivered. They were delivered to threaten the Russian Black Sea Fleet. These harpoons pose no threat to us anymore. Unbiased experts also confirmed that we have said since the very beginning the grain terminal of Odessa port is located at a considerable distance from the military part. There are no obstacles to starting deliveries of grain to customers in line with the deal signed, and we have not created them. In the meantime, Mr. Lavrov, speaking in a Congo Republic, defended a missile attack on the Ukrainian port of Odessa. The missiles had hit Odessa on Saturday, a day after Moscow and Kiev had signed a deal designed to ease global food shortages by allowing exports across the Black Sea. He says the strike had been aimed at military infrastructure uh, at the ports. Mr. Lavrov added that the green uh, uh, terminal, as you just heard, is a considerable distance from the military part, and there was nothing to stop uh, uh, the delivery of grain. His African tour is designed to strengthen Moscow's ties with the continent that has a tangled legacy of ties with both the West and the former Soviet Union. African countries have largely avoided taking sides in the war in Ukraine. And French President Emmanuel Macron has landed in Cameroon, uh, where he will discuss food production and how the country, Central Africa's biggest economy and an agricultural hub, will try to fill the Ukraine-linked supply vacuum in the region. Mr. Macron's four-day visit to Cameroon, Benin Republic, and Guinea-Bissau is his first diplomatic trip outside of Europe since winning re-election. The visit is seen as showing up bilateral cooperation for France at a time when Russian officials have also been visiting African nations to rally support. 
of particular concern for Mr. Macron are links in the wider African region, including in the Central African Republic and Mali, to the Wagner Group, the Russian parliamentary organization seen by the European Union as a destabilizing force. Let's talk to Mr. Ambrose Igboke, uh, Chairman, Guild of Public Affairs Analysts, who joins us uh, virtually uh, from Enugu. Uh, good morning to you, Mr. Igboke. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Igboke. Uh, good That's morning, what I buddy. said. That's what I said. Maybe the maybe the transmission is what is not letting yeah. you hear me clearly. <laughs> <laughs> good morning to you. <laughs> good morning to you. Good morning, good morning to you. Uh, good morning. Af Africa is receiving a lot of visitors from both sides of uh, the divide, uh, shall we say. Um, Emmanuel Macron yeah. is in Cameroon and he's going to Benin Republic and uh, Guinea-Bissau. Uh, Sergei Lavrov uh, was in Egypt. Uh, he's going to Congo. Uh, uh, is there any reason why this is happening at this time? Uh, because Africa seemed to have been ignored before now. Well, there's a, there's a lot happening. Uh, firstly, uh, Europe is stagnated of energy needs from uh, because of gas from is cutting down because of Russia. You know, Europe energy needs is much dependent on uh, Russia gas supply, and also some uh, then the uh, wheat and grain supply uh, is dependent on Ukraine. So Europe is in a tight corner. So Europe has come to Africa to exploit Africa to get its energy needs. Remember that um, Germany in the la in last month uh, restarted its coal, its abandoned coal energy plant. So where do they get the coal from? They are coming to Africa. Now, where do they get grains from to augment what is left before Ukraine starts exporting? Africa. And uh, Russia doesn't want to be left behind. Uh, Russia is very happy with Africa because Africa has taken a position of a non-aligned position in this uh, Ukraine-Russian uh, war. Um, it didn't support Russia. It didn't support uh, America, uh, uh, NATO. It did not condemn the war. Uh, you know, it's just playing a, a non-aligned position. And that Russia is grateful for. Uh, African countries did not join NATO in uh, uh, blockading or giving sanctions to Russia. So basically, it's business as usual with Russia and the African countries. And so they are also coming to see how they can wrap up, how they can you know, discuss energy needs, how they can even make, maybe uh, try to upturn the American hold in the oil market from Africa. Remember that Russia is already selling its own uh, oil exports with uh, rubles. Uh, and I think they will want to also clip the wing of the US dollars in African uh, uh, continental market, especially when it concerns export. So a lot is going on now. But my worry is this. Europe knows what, knows what it wants from Africa. Russia knows what it wants. United States of America knows what it wants. Everybody is coming to steal or pilfer or exploit or rape Africa. The problem now is, do, do African leaders know what they want? Now, I expect a, a, an emergency uh, uh, special summit of the heads of state of uh, African Union to have come together as an emergency, have a meeting, and take a position on some of the issues that are arising from this Ukraine-Russian war. Uh, this uh, uh, cutting of uh, Europe and other uh, Western powers is not, for the, uh, it's not because it was to benefit Africa. It's because they need the help of Africa. So Africa is an advantageous position now to make some demands to cancel some debt, make some diplomatic demands. And this is a time to you know, you know, dig in, in terms of uh, uh, diplomatic negotiations, and in terms of trade tariff, and in, trade of, uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of many other things that Africans have been disadvantaged from before. Now is the time for Africans to wake up and do that. But they are not, the African continent is not doing it. ECOWAS is not doing it. AU is not doing it. So what is doing it? Perhaps it's time for ACTA to also look at what are the various businesses, apart from the country, can take a, a unique position in terms of economic trade? It's all about the economy. And Africa should key in to see how they can extract a lot of commitments from Europe and America now. It does, uh, as you say that, of course, what comes to mind is that if we uh, bring it a bit uh, uh, closer home, uh, 
both uh, the foreign minister of Russia, Lavrov, uh, Sergei Lavrov, and uh, the French president are on the African continent, as we've already reported. Uh, but both of them are not coming. Neither of them is coming to Nigeria on this current trips. And we both know that uh, uh, Russia is a big uh, client of Nigeria's in terms of uh, wheat exports, uh, grain exports, uh, amongst other things. Uh, and uh, it does appear that part of the problem why what you say uh, may not happen uh, in the long run, it has always been this age-long dichotomy uh, between the Anglophone and the Francophone uh, parts of Africa, which its former colonial powers uh, continue to foster. So you find that uh, the French president is going to Cameroon, one of its former uh, uh, colonies. It's going to Bene Republic, which is another former colony. Uh, and then it's going to Guinea-Bissau. Uh, and uh, Sergei Lavrov has also chosen countries uh, uh, who are big client states of Russia. So again, it doesn't seem as if Nigeria is in the mix here and we therefore cannot do the thing that you are saying that we ought to be doing or that the African leaders ought to be doing? Well, first of all, Nigeria's foreign policy is currently very, very weak. Uh, uh, you know, when we cast our backs, mind back to the 1970s, after the Nigerian Biafran War, where, you know, in the mid-70s, uh, where, you know, ECOWAS was formed in 1975, and then we had... Um, when the Morita Loba Senjo regime came on board in 1975, uh, July 29, 1975, uh, there was a, a, a purposeful effort to align with uh, the Soviet bloc that time. We call it the East bloc. When uh, Nigeria uh, you know, went against the Western bloc, went against Britain that was supporting appetite in South Africa, in the southern part of Africa, in Rhodesia, in uh, South Africa itself, and some other uh, African countries, you know, even in Namibia and some other countries. Now, Abbas and John Mohamed Mohammed uh, government ensured that they supported, they aligned with the uh, Soviet Union that time. That was a very strong policy statement. They went against Britain. They went against America. They fought appetite to a standstill. They even went as far as, you know, buying arms, Russian arms for, for uh, guerrilla fighters that were fighting appetite then. Uh, that is how somebody like uh, the late Robert Mugabe uh, came to power, Joseph Joma, and all those people, those times. You know, Nigeria was at the forefront of, you know, rallying points, both militarily, policy statements, and the international diplomacy to ensure that uh, appetite was stopped in, uh, in uh, Africa. So Nigeria was bold then. And they remember that you could see the remnants of that relationship with the Soviet Union. You know, the Delta State Company, Omi Alaja, the steel, the pioneer steel plant in uh, Nigeria in, 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 was built by the Russians mostly. Then the uh, Ajokuta steel plant also. And then we could see the Russian, like for example, the National Theater uh, in Ngome, I think was also built by the Russians. We could see those, uh, you know, legacies of that relationship with the Soviet bloc still existing in Nigeria today. And so also Nigeria took strong state uh, positions when it also in the, in the 80s and then, but, when Ambassador came back in 1999, he took strong positions, but this time around, favoring the West, but he was able to write off the debt, uh, the long debt of Nigeria from both the Paris Club and some other borrow, uh, international borrowers. But when he, uh, after Ambassador left, uh, we have not really had strong policies. We have not had uh, strong uh, foreign uh, relations. And that is what is affecting us. Because by now, we are supposed to have taken a position because basically, by now, we don't have anything to negotiate upon. I mean, what are we negotiating with? We, we are an, export, we are an uh, important nation. Where, um, uh, we are having security issues. Uh, our FDI is poor. Our GDP is not, not to be taken seriously. Our NARA value is down the hill. We don't have a functional uh, economy. We don't even have uh, you know, a functional health system. So where are, we, where are we really, really going to negotiate from? But despite these abysmal uh, pictures we have, we have something going for us. We have the capital, a uh, human capital resource. And that is one thing about Nigeria. Nigeria's population is filled with human capital resource, people that can do well anywhere. And any country, the greatest asset is have is the human beings. So this is the time to harness what do we want to negotiate with. We have to, neg we have to look for something to negotiate with this one to tell them that, look, come, let us do business. But you know the index, 
of all foreign uh, economics suggests that Nigeria is not a good place to do business for now. Therefore, they are avoiding Nigeria like a plague because we have not put our house together. We have not put our acts together. We have not been able to really tell people for FDI, foreign direct investment, to come and say, okay, we are comfortable investing in Nigeria. So when these presidents go around, they go around to negotiate for their businesses. They go around to negotiate for businessmen in their countries. They, they, go, they don't just go to shake hands. When they go negotiate deals so that businesses in their country can come invest in those countries and then they can pay taxes back home. That is what they go around. So they are also there for investment drive and see how they can you know, exploit the raw materials in those countries, see how they can dump their goods in those countries and see how they can have economic, political and military advantages over those countries. That is why those presidents are going there. Indeed, uh, uh, again, we, we seem to be lagging behind in all of this, as you just pointed out. Uh, what would be our bargaining position? What would be the bargaining position uh, of the African uh, continent? Uh, Mr. Ambrose Igboke, thank you so much for your time this morning uh, on the program. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ladi. You got the name right. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ukraine is seeking to introduce heavy penalties for receiving Russian citizenship. Deputy Minister for the Reintegration of Temporarily Occupied Territories, Anatoly Stelmak, says the bill that is currently being considered by Kiev proposes fines and lengthy prison terms for doing so. The idea of criminalizing obtaining Russian citizenship was backed by a Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for the Reintegration uh, of the territories, Irina Vesichuk. The official openly admitted the legislation was driven more by political rather than illegal motives. Early in June, Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a decree granting all Ukrainians the right to apply uh, for Russian citizenship under a simplified procedure. By doing so, he extended the simplified procedures that had previously been rolled out for citizens of the Donetsk and Dohansk People's Republics as well as residents of Kherson and Zaporizhzhia regions, which are largely controlled by Russian uh, forces. Officials from France's energy ministry have said that the country is against setting uniform targets for reduction of gas consumption in Europe amidst a looming energy crisis. The future targets must notably take into account the export capacities of each country ahead of uh, a meeting of uh, European energy mi uh, ministers today in Brussels. The European Union's executive arm had proposed that all members should cut their gas use from August to March by 15%. The target would, of course, initially be voluntary, but could become uh, mandatory. And Russia tightened its gas squeeze on Europe as Gazprom said supplies through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline to Germany would drop to just 20% of its capacity. Gazprom said flows would fall to 33 million cubic meters per day from uh, 0400 GMT on Wednesday, a halving of the current already reduced level because it needed to halt the operation of a gas turbine at a compressor station on instructions from an industry watchdog. Germany said it saw no technical reason for the latest reduction, which comes as Russia and the West exchange economic blows in response to what Moscow calls its special military operation uh, in uh, Ukraine. The Dutch front month gas contract, the European benchmark, closed 9.95% higher on news of the latest blow to Nord Stream 1, the pipeline which has a capacity of 55 billion cubic meters uh, a year, which is the single biggest Russian gas link in Europe. We'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll pack some of those business stories with Ine John Mekwa, who will join me at the time. Plus, we'll have uh, uh, news uh, from the sports desk, as well as support for the vulnerable. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned to welcome back. And as promised, Inik John McQuay is here. Morning, Inik. Good morning. Uh, the story just read, uh, just before the break, which is Russia tightening the... Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's tightening the squeeze, because <laughs> it says that it has technical reasons uh, for reducing the supply. 
which it had already reduced. Which had a, yes, which is already reduced. Um, so, you know, before all of this, uh, Europe used to get about 40% of their gas right. from uh, Russia. So now it's been reduced, uh, I think, to about 20%, and now they want to squeeze it even more. And, you know, there are talks that uh, maybe by, the, uh, by Monday, which is the 1st of August, right. they're going to cut it off. Entirely. Yes. Which is why the energy ministers are meeting are today. Are meeting today. And, uh, of course, uh, even, even, even just by... By, let's say rumors or something we're already having re a, a lot of reactions Germany is on the verge of recession now because already energy prices are high and you just read yeah, how that 9.95 percent rise exactly just over the last 48 hours exactly and they cannot seem to agree you know that problem they have again in Europe because the economies are on different levels they cannot seem to agree on the cuts that they are going to do on energy consumption the smaller countries are saying look you cannot just come and cut us off like that already we are being squeezed what are we going to do? And the other side is oil prices have already started reacting from yesterday. Right. You know, once the story was out, because it was yesterday that they started reducing it yes. and are still going to reduce even more. You know, oil prices started surging in the midst of, oh, there's a recession, demands are going down. But just with that anticipation and that news alone, oil prices have started surging. This morning is still surging. It's on 106. We went from 105 yesterday, 106 this morning. So um, it, it, it's is it, I don't know. We haven't found a solution yet. A lot of countries are going back to coal now, and uh, unfortunately, environmentalists are not, you know, uh, uh, are taking the compromise because there's a rating that is done for investment. There's a group of investment uh, who are very conscious of the environment, so there's a rating that they do, and to ensure that you are climate change compliant. Not, if not, they will not invest in your country. Now, these countries, a lot of European countries, stand the risk of losing out in that right. because the environmentalists and the climate change activists are not agreeing to the compromise of going back to coal and all of that but countries are actually squeezed because if there's no energy for production if i no energy before you go to production no energy for living because That's right. it's cold because there keeping warm exactly and all of that. so how do you even talk about production uh, already manufactured goods are higher now because of, and then we are talking of recession in the uk we are talking of recession now in germany very prominent in the, in germany now because of this present threat which might just come on on monday which is the first first of august this is uh this is something else uh again but one would look at it again at uh, the economic squeeze uh from two angles we've been reporting since this crisis began that uh china is backing russia yeah uh, and uh even if not overtly but covertly exactly uh but now we're hearing that the belt and road initiative which is the projects big projects and, yes, and all of that that china is doing they're reducing it in russia yeah, well, they're reducing it in Russia. They're reducing it in Egypt, and um, they're reducing it in Sri Lanka. So um, there, there are many, many conversations around this. The first is China is afraid of the second uh, secondary uh, sanction, which may come on them if they continue, you know, just glaringly doing business with China. They might just attract some harm on them. That is one. But on the other hand, they're saying that, well, China is trying to take care of its home front also. I mean, a lot of countries, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, they did it a lot in Africa. Right. And a lot of African countries have not been able to repay back, you know, the money that they have already spent. So so it, it has, uh, they are not encouraged to continue, to continue with and perhaps it, yeah. that is the reason with Russia. But that's on one hand, because on the other hand, we're saying that uh, maybe it's the, the fear of secondary sanctions, and they're just trying to, but when you look at Sri Lanka, even in Sri Lanka's case, I mean, we know what has happened in the country and, and all of that. And what is still happening. And what is still happening, because even the new president, uh, the voices of the people say that's not the person they want. So we don't know how they're going to react to that. Stability is not yet back in, in, in Sri Lanka. but. Uh, uh, it's not just Russia, uh, even though the reasons for Russia may be what people are saying. Which is this issue of the sanction. Yeah, the fear of the secondary sanction. But, uh, I mean, I think every country is just trying to take care of itself oh, at this yeah, time. Yeah, well, self first, everybody else after. Exactly. Uh, uh, and then, uh, speaking of self first, in Finland, its uh, largest parliamentary groups want them to limit tourist visas to Russia. To Russia, yes. So in the midst of all of this, the war and everything, uh, the, the requests for tourist visa in Finland. Remember Finland used yes. to depend on Russia Indeed. for energy, for gas, and they no longer have that support. But a lot of Russians are going there.
And so, and so the, fin the Finnish are saying, okay, you want to come to our country for tourism, you say. Fine, it could boost our, com our commerce, our tourism. But cry for crying out loud, you don't have... <laughs> you <laughs> how, just... how exactly are we suddenly this attractive? Exactly, you know. So it looks like a lot of Russians are finding... Um, uh, a buffer or a place of peace or so in Finland. So the parliament suddenly woke up and like, they get about a thousand requests for a day. You know, 1,000 requests for a day. And, and remember, Finland isn't exactly a very big country. It is, it's not a big country. The economy is also just managing, you know, and they're part of those who are saying we can't just cut off. I mean, I know they had said that uh, they don't really depend so much on, on Russian gas, but when the cuts came, they felt it, Absolutely. you know, because they have diversified form of energy and everything. But they're like, okay, so should we now be taking care of Russians after what you have done to us? Please stay in your country this, and, this, this, and, and that's enjoy why I your said gas. This is all this issue of. Uh, self selfers. Yes. It's always selfers. <laughs> yes, that's uh, how that, the world is. That's that's the way the world is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure uh, that, 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 that there's a lot of uh, interesting things that will happen in the aftermath of that meeting uh, that is taking place in Brussels today. Yes. Um, from what we've been reporting, uh, unanimity is unlikely uh, because there are so many exemptions that have already yes. built, built into yes. the agreement that they're expected to sign today. Thank you, Ini. Uh, of course, we'll expect more of this as well as uh, what is happening with oil prices, because that's the one that concerns us. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, we, we, we want to see how that is, and hopefully the grain exports will start the not The grain exports, we are really looking forward to that. We see they say they will start in days, and we do hope that Russia will keep to its word, word and let's and allow that not hear any more... Uh, of attacks uh, on, on, on the ports. Yes. Thank you thank you so much, Any More of that on Business Morning that follows this program, and then Business Incorporated uh, later on in the day at 1.30. In the sports news, uh, Ukrainian football legend uh, Andrei Shevchenko, you remember him, has called for more mental health support for young refugees after he paid a surprise visit to meet children who have fled the horrors of war in his country. Shevchenko and his son Jordan visited a summer school in Warsaw that is helping children from Ukraine catch up on missed learning and play. Since the conflict began over five months ago, at least 5.8 million refugees from Ukraine have been recorded across Europe, half of whom are expected to be children. Save the Children's Summer Schools for children from Ukraine in Poland are providing a safe haven where young refugees can boost their education, mental health and psychosocial well-being. Some children uh, saw his parents been killed. And then this program gonna help, you know, through physical activity and in the points when they just playing, just release that tension, they forget about uh, all the very bad things would happen in Ukraine. Just get him back to normal life. Playing with other kids, to communicate it, you know, try to to bring the the kids to be kids, to be happy, to play around and and forget about the war. Ola Vorovi focuses, uh, that's the chess player rather, Sergei Rajikvin has confirmed that he is filing a civil case in appeal against the International Chess Federation's decision to ban him from international competitions for publicly supporting the war in Ukraine. Karajin uh, uh, stated he would also look to file an appeal after the Russian Fest, uh, Chess Federation refused to do so. Karajin, who is Russian, published an open letter on February the 27th in support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which a Russian President Vladimir Putin had been calling a special military operation. In March, the International Chess Federation Commission on Ethics and Discipline suspended Karajin from its competitions for six months for the open letter. And now I can tell you about Oli Vorovin, who is focusing on uh, the Forklix uh, gear shift as an instructor directs her to slowly inch the machine forward towards a stack of pallets at a warehouse where she has found work after escaping the war in Ukraine. Wearing a yellow safety vest, a white work gloves, and a navy cap, 
This refugee is on a four-week course to earn a certification to operate forklifts as part of an initiative from automotive supplier for Russia to replace male Ukrainians who returned to fight following Russia's uh, February 24 invasion. Uh, companies across Central Europe are scrambling to fill places left open by Ukrainian men who provided the blue-collar labor that powered manufacturing, construction, automotive, and other heavy industries. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians had flocked to Central Europe in the past decade, filling jobs not highly paid enough to attract local workers in construction. Many of these workers have now returned home after Ukraine declared martial law in February and required male citizens to make themselves available for military service. Uh, our strength in the market, uh, which is very competitive in our economic zone, uh, but also I think uh, uh, we need to adapt uh, to current uh, situation on the market. Industry is mainly meant for, for men. There are many constraints, like for instance the minimum weight they, they can carry, women, I mean. So uh, this was like the, the best and the simplest solution to give them chance to get a job and to get a better salary. During this, this um, inquiry we've, we've done with the women, 2,000 women which were our potential candidates, 28%, which is about 600, uh, answered positive. So the answer was, was very surprising for us, uh, very good, very high. Now we have like a few tens uh, of, um, of the women started the trainings. Ukrainian workers for, uh, for us are crucial because uh, in Polish market there's no enough Polish workers. So without Ukrainian workers, this company couldn't uh, really exist. Barely a kilometer from Russian positions defending the captured eastern city of Izum, Ukrainian and foreign fighters hunker in a dank a basement. Artillery rains down on them most nights, shaking loose the plaster and filling the air with dust. At the sharp end of efforts to stop the Russian army's progress in eastern Ukraine are the Carpathian 6th Battalion and a unit of foreign nationals who answered Kiev's call for help to comfort the invaders. The fighters say they are bound together by a fierce commitment to Ukraine that is now being put to a punishing test. The Carpathian Sikh is one of several paramilitary nationalist groups that began as volunteers in 2014 when Russia invaded and later annexed Ukraine's coastal Crimea region. But since mid-May, the battalion's fighters have been able to sign military contracts that entitle them to pensions and treatment at military hospitals. A move Kiev says shows nationalist units have been reformed and successfully integrated into the regular armed forces. What am I going to tell my children? God willing, I have them someday. Um, when when they grow up, or even my grandchildren, and they ask me about these, you know, these truly historical times we're living in, uh, and I felt that <clears throat> the only um, dignified response would be that, yes, I was doing my part. I was I was fighting alongside with everyone else. Just seeing all the people and women and children and, and the guys and men and stuff all injured and seeing how little training and knowledge they had to, to be able to help. So I thought some of the knowledge that I've been trained in, bring it out here and we've helped set up field hospitals. We might have to consider to widen our uh, recruitment pool again uh, and the, the details of that is still uh, are still being figured out. Candidates, you are going to have decreasing numbers over time. Uh, so we've spent the first few months of the war with uh, nearly no or nearly well, nearly no casualties uh, in the first few months. Um, it started to uh, to tick in, uh, especially in the last months or month and a half, unfortunately. Uh, so our attrition comes mostly, first and foremost, from people who decide to leave and go back home, um, which is their right. Puts many people in difficult circumstances, but then you find that people still want to volunteer for what they believe in. That's our program this morning. Thanks for being with us. I'm Ladi Akiri Dudwali. There's an update, as always, and the world's day at 5 o'clock. The show's back tomorrow. Good morning.